There are 195 officially recognized countries in the world today. And while the world map may seem set in stone now, it's obviously undergone a lot of changes throughout human history and will change more in the future. In the last 40 years alone, the United Nations has recognized 34 new countries, the newest being South Sudan. But there are some countries that have come and gone before the rest of the world could even blink an eye. Welcome back to Nutty History. Let's dive into some geopolitics, draw up some borders, and take a look at some of the shortest lived countries in history. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. Now, before we start, it'll be useful to understand just what exactly makes a country a country. It may seem like a pretty cut and dry definition. Borders, people, a bunch of politicians yelling at each other, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that. There are two theories that help us define whether a country is actually a country. The first is called the constitutive theory. Constitutive theory says that a country is a country if one other sovereign country recognizes it as a country. Today, this recognition is gained through the United Nations. But back in the day, there was no UN. The UN only formed after World War II in 1945. So, if we want to go back further using this theory, well, it gets kind of squirrely. And it is now my duty, my honor and my privilege in the chair to call for a vote on the approval of the Charter of the United Nations. Nation by nation, the delegates stand up for the great new charter they hammered out together. Fifty nations standing side by side, unanimous for peace. The constitutive theory gets messy because maybe one country recognizes another as a country, while others don't. Take northern Cyprus, for example. Back in 1974, Turkey invaded Cyprus and claimed the northern half for itself, declaring it a new country called the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. So is northern Cyprus now a country? Well, according to the constitutive theory, it technically is. Turkey recognizes it, but it was Turkey that invaded and took it in the first place. So what gives? Today, Northern Cyprus isn't recognized as a sovereign state by any other nation other than Turkey. Then there is the declarative theory. This one says that recognition by another sovereign country is necessary to make a country a country. Instead, it gives a list of criteria for statehood if it has a defined territory, a government, a permanent population, and the capacity to enter into foreign relations with other states, then it's a country. But again, things get messy. Northern Cyprus meets all these criteria. Palestine meets these criteria. States that very briefly ceded from the U.S. just before the Civil War would technically meet these criteria. For example, the Republic of Louisiana left the U.S. in January of 1861 and for two brief weeks was its own independent country before joining up with the Confederate States. Then take the strange example of the sovereign military order of Malta, not to be confused with the Republic of Malta. This country has its own stamps, its own flag, its own currency, and is recognized by over 100 UN nations. The only problem though is that the sovereign military order of Malta doesn't have any official land. It rents a base at Rome and has a lease on a fort in Malta, but other than that, there's no geographical proof the country exists. According to declarative theory, the defined territory part is missing. So with all that said, let's look at some of the shortest lived countries and see where they fit into this confusing picture of countryness. Yemen is one of the most devastated countries in the world. It's facing one of the world's worst hunger crises with more than 23 million people in dire need of humanitarian aid and has been in the throes of civil unrest for years. Yemen was actually once two countries, South Yemen and North Yemen. South Yemen became independent in 1967 after a revolution supported by the Soviet Union ended British rule in the region. More unrest followed between the North and South with another conflict erupting in 1986 in South Yemen, which led to thousands of casualties. In 1990, North and South Yemen were unified, though it was a very fragile unification. When an authoritarian named Ali Abdullah Saleh took power, the fighting got worse. 
There was another conflict in 1994, and the northern and southern armies were never fully integrated, which has contributed to the situation we see today. Amidst all this conflict, one of the shortest-lived countries in modern history popped into and out of existence. On May 21, 1994, almost all of what was formerly South Yemen declared itself the Democratic Republic of Yemen. They had their own flag, a president and a prime minister, a socialist government, territory, and, at least in theory, the capacity for foreign relations. However, the short-lived republic was never intentionally recognized, and after a little over a month, North Yemeni forces toppled the republic and reunified the country, a reunification that would prove to be very fragile. We hear the word Caucasian a lot to describe people of a lighter complexion. But not many people know what or where Caucasia actually is. Caucasia is a region east of Turkey and north of Iran, nestled between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Today, it includes the countries of Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. No, not that Georgia. This Georgia. It's a region with a rich history, one that's far older and more diverse than most Westerners realize. Georgia, for example, is the birthplace of wine. They started making it more than 8,000 years ago and it's really, really good. Go there today and you'll be drowning in the stuff. Anyway, Caucasia is a very ancient place. Now, each of these countries has a very distinct culture and history. However, back in April of 1918, they decided to unite to form the brief nation of Transcaucasia. After the October Revolution and the rise of the Bolsheviks in what would soon become the Soviet Union, the leaders in these caucuses decided it would be a good idea to band together and create a state that could unite against its neighbors in the North and West. Threats from the soon-to-be Soviets in the North and threats from Turkey in the West ended up making that a difficult task, and just one month later, Georgia declared its independence. This led Azerbaijan and Armenia to declare their own nations just two days later, and the grand unification of the Caucasus was finished before it had barely begun. Was Transcaucasia internationally recognized? Well, yes, sort of. The Ottomans, an empire that was about to break apart completely after World War I and become Turkey, did officially recognize it as a state. But they quickly pulled an about face and decided to threaten invasion instead. The Ottoman Empire was a shell of its former self at this point, though, and wasn't really strong enough to pose much of a threat. The next one gets a bit wacky and complicated with multiple short-lived states existing in a region that had been ravaged by colonial rule for years. The Sultanate of Zanzibar existed as a state from 1856 to 1963. Zanzibar, for the geographically challenged, is an island off the coast of Tanzania in East Africa. Starting in 1890, though, the Sultanate had become a British protectorate, effectively under the control of the largest empire in the history of the world. There was some tug of war between the British and the Germans, who also had established colonies in the area, but the two European powers decided to split up the territory, and the Germans ended up controlling some of what would today be mainland Tanzania. Then, in 1963, the United Kingdom ended its protectorate over the Sultan of Zanzibar, granting it independence and membership in the Commonwealth of Nations, a collection of former British colonies that's still around today. Go to Canada or New Zealand, for example, and take cash out of an ATM, and you'll notice the Queen's face is still emblazoned on the 20s. Go buy coffee and get some change, and you'll notice Her Royal Majesty's face on many of the coins. Rest her soul. Anyway, the Sultanate of Zanzibar became an independent constitutional monarchy on December 10, 1963, and was recognized as such by the UN. But just a month later, the Sultan was overthrown in the Zanzibar Revolution, and the Sultanate became the People's Republic of Zanzibar, which would only exist as a nation for another couple of months before it merged with the nation of Tanganyika to become the United Republic of Tanganyika and Zanzibar, which would eventually change its name to Tanzania. Tanganyika, meanwhile, only existed as a country for about two years, from 1962 to 1964. The whole situation is a not-so-shining example of the messy, vicious, exploitive nature of colonialism in Africa. The Sultanate of Zanzibar might have the claim to the shortest-lived country that fell under both the constitutive and declarative theories of statehood. 
However, there is one more brief link with countryness that may also deserve some consideration. That is a tiny archipelago between Norway and Iceland called the Faroe Islands. Popular mostly for seabirds traveling between the two Scandinavian nations, the Faroe Islands and its population of less than 50,000 was controlled by Norway until the 1800s, until it fell into the hands of Denmark. And then, in 1946, the Faroe Island government held an independent referendum and the people voted, very narrowly, in favor of becoming a sovereign state, with a tight split, 50.7% in favor of full independence and 49.3% in favor of remaining a Danish territory. There were complications, however. 4% of the votes were considered invalid, cast by voters who rejected both proposals and the Faroe government became deadlocked and couldn't agree on what to do next. Just two days later, the Danish government intervened and called for new elections. On the second go-around, the majority voted to stay part of Denmark and it's been that way ever since. What makes a country a country can be a difficult thing to wrap your head around, especially if that country only pops into existence for a few days or weeks. What would you call your own country if you tried to declare one? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.